Boom Supersonic is promising to create a new supersonic airliner to follow in the footsteps of the awesome Concorde. But lately, some questions have started to arise around the viability of the project and specifically around who is going to make their engines. Stay tuned. The question, which is your favorite aircraft of all time, has a lot of possible answers. There are several aircraft who have revolutionized commercial aviation in its own way throughout the history. The Douglas DC-3, the Boeing 707 and of course the Boeing 747 are some examples that immediately come to mind. But no airliner have ever looked as different and been as different from everything else than the Concorde was. The Concorde was a sleek, pointy-nosed, delta-wing, beautiful-looking aircraft with four afterburning turbojet engines that could fly at twice the speed of sound, as high as 60,000 feet. So I am willing to bet that even if the Concorde isn't your all-time favorite aircraft, it is likely high on your list, and it certainly is on mine. So I think it's really sad that the Concorde was retired without anything to replace it back in 2003. It was sad, but not entirely surprising. And why is that, you might ask? Well, there is still some debate whether or not Air France and British Airways ever really managed to run their Concorde fleets with any consistent profit. Although talking about pure profit from an aircraft type is a bit unfair on Concorde as a design, because some of its high costs simply had to do with the small number of planes that were ever made and the limited number of routes that they were able to fly on. It also had to do with the unique experience that the passengers expected when they flew on them. And I'll give you one example of that. So both British Airways and Air France needed to keep extra Concorde and crews on standbys at each of their routes, because if one had a technical problem, its passengers wouldn't just accept a ride in a replacement 747, for example, since that would take more than twice the time. Although that meant some huge costs for the airlines, it also created some unique opportunities. For example, when the original aircraft had departed, which it usually did, then, especially towards the end of the Concorde career, British Airways and Air France would use the standby aircraft and crew to offer Concorde trip experiences. On those trips, the passengers would fly a short but still supersonic flight, lasting just over one and a half hours. And since the planes needed much less fuel and the passengers had no luggage on these flights, it made the aircraft very light. And this meant that the airlines could make a bit of money and still offer these trips at lower prices to anyone who wanted to experience supersonic flight. Now, when I say lower price, I mean relatively speaking, because in today's money, those experiences still costed around 1500 euros or 1500 dollars. These flights also served another purpose, as they helped British Airways and Air France to keep their crews current and qualified on the aircraft. But for normal flights, the economics of keeping these jets profitable were more challenging. They burned an enormous amount of fuel per passenger, and the noise footprint would not be acceptable today. Another issue was that even if Concorde made some money for its airlines, and that's a big if, it still didn't nearly cover the cost of its development. That development just wouldn't have been possible without substantial government support. This kind of government backing wasn't unusual for the 1960s and 70s. Boeing's 2707 supersonic transporter, or the SST, also got substantial US government funding before its cancellation. But here we come to the first hurdle. So realistically, a 21st century successor to the Concorde can't expect to get similar support. They will have to bear the cost of development entirely by themselves and their investors, and they must be able to recoup those investments through the sales of the aircraft. Also, environmental considerations mean that those supersonic trip experiences that the Concorde was able to do would likely meet some fierce resistance today, if there is even a market for them. Over the years, there have been some studies and proposals for other supersonic airliners, but none has led anywhere. But that all changed when the American startup Boom Supersonic entered the picture in 2014. Boom is planning to use the huge technological leaps that the aviation industry has enjoyed in the decades since the Concorde's launch to produce a fitting Concorde replacement. One that could be truly profitable and still relatively green by making sure that the aircraft can be run 100% on sustainable aviation fuel. Today, the boom engineers are benefiting from things that the Concorde designers could only dream of. Things like advanced composites for lightweight structures with unusual shapes, much more knowledge on advanced aerodynamics and, of course, hugely more efficient engines. 
The aircraft that Boom is working on is called the Overture and we have already seen a few design iterations of it. Initially, it was supposed to be fitted with three engines, two under the wings and another one installed in the tail, kind of like on the DC-10. But Boom eventually moved away from that design, partially because that configuration might have required a different engine to be fitted in the tail than those under the wings. And operationally and in terms of maintenance, this would have been far from ideal. I don't know if I've ever heard about an aircraft that runs different engines on the same airframe. So Boom modified the Overture, revealing its definite design in July this year, 2022. In its final form, the aircraft now has four engines, all under the wings, and has many similarities with the Concorde, but also some crucial differences. The Overture will, for example, be able to carry between 65 and 80 passengers, and that's to be compared with Concorde, who was able to carry 100 passengers. And its cruise speed would be Mach 1.7, which is slower than Concorde, who typically cruise at just above Mach 2. The Overture and the Concorde will have the same maximum cruise altitude of 60,000 feet, but the Overture will have a bit longer range, 4,250 nautical miles to the Concorde's 3,900. Size-wise, the aircraft are almost identical in length. The Overture will be 201 feet, or 61 meters long, and that's just 1 feet, or 30 centimeters shorter than the Concorde was. But the Overture's wingspan will be 106 feet or 32 meters, where Concorde was only 84 feet, that's 25.6 meters. Finally, unlike Concorde, Boom's Overture will likely have horizontal stabilizers and elevators. This fact also makes the final configuration of the Overture quite similar to Boeing's old designs for the 2707 SST, which was scrapped back in 1971. That aircraft also had horizontal tail surfaces, but the SST would have been much bigger and much faster, carrying more than 200 passengers at a speed around Mach 2.7, faster even than the Concorde. So now that you know a little bit more about the Overture, what's the latest news about its development and why would there be any worry about its engines? Well, before we get to that, here's a short message from my sponsor who makes it possible for me to create these videos. Before we continue, let me share something with all of you. As an airline pilot, mastering several languages can be really handy. And for quite some time, I've been on the hunt for a great language app that allows me to learn as quickly as possible and teaches me how to sound natural, you know, like a true local. When I found Speakly, today's sponsor, I knew I'd found something really special. Speakly teaches you words and sentences based on their relevance in real life situations. This unique methodology elevates you from zero to solid speaking skills in around three to four months with just 30 minutes of daily learning practice. There are eight languages available, including Spanish, French, Italian, German, Finnish, Russian, Estonian, and English. The app's creators actually know how a language works. They are two polygots who both speak seven languages and trust me, they're not going to bombard you with something that you won't use. So check out the link in the description below. It's completely free for the first seven days. And if you use this link, you'll get a further 60% discount on the yearly subscription. So thank you Speakly for sponsoring this video. Now back to the video. In early September, the news broke that the engine manufacturer Rolls-Royce would not be making the engines for the Boom Overture. This was big news because when Rolls-Royce partnered with Boom in July 2020, it was a huge boost of confidence for the program. It turned out though that the relationship between Boom and Rolls-Royce wasn't officially a partnership between an aircraft manufacturer and an engine manufacturer, even though that's what it sounded like. The two companies described their relationship as an engagement agreement to explore the pairing of a Rolls-Royce propulsion system with Boom's flagship supersonic passenger aircraft. But like I said, in September, Rolls-Royce announced that its contract with Boom was now completed. The engine maker said that it delivered various engineering studies for Boom's Overture and in the company's press release it also included the following statement. Rolls-Royce has determined that the commercial aviation supersonic market is not currently a priority for us and therefore we will not pursue further work on the program at this time. It has been a pleasure to work with the Boom team and we wish them every success in the future. This likely happened because in order for Rolls-Royce to commit to Boom's project as an engine supplier, it would need to commit substantial amounts of its own money in developing a suitable engine. In an interview with Jun Ostrower from The Air Current back in August, Rolls-Royce CEO Warren East said that the engine maker's development projects at the time only involved its business jet engines and its future ultrafan airliner engine, which by the way we might do a video about soon. 
So if Rolls-Royce won't make an engine for Boom Supersonic, maybe someone else would be interested? Let's look at what kind of an engine the Overture will ultimately need. So Boom is looking for an engine with a thrust output between 15,000 and 20,000 pounds, or 67 to 89 kilonewtons. That's a bit less power than what the CFM-56 made, that's the engine that's used by aircraft like the Airbus A320 or the Boeing 737 NG. But for Boom, the big challenge in finding the right engine isn't simply about the amount of power produced. You see, engines for supersonic use are very different from those that you see under the wings of subsonic airliners. Usually what aircraft designers want for a standard airliner is a turbofan engine with a big bypass ratio. Meaning that most of the airflow going through the engine doesn't actually go through the engine core. Instead, the air goes around the main core and out the back, essentially bypassing the core, hence the term bypass ratio. This hugely improved fuel consumption and reduces noise, but it also makes the engines very big with a huge front surface area. The Concorde's engines were turbojets, where all of the airflow goes through the core, and back when that was designed, creating a turbofan engine for supersonic use was very difficult, because the bigger frontal area of the turbofans becomes a problem in supersonic applications. Now, the Soviet Tupolev 144 actually did have turbofans, but they managed to make them even less efficient than the Concorde with its turbojets was. Of course, that was many decades ago now, and today there are more modern turbofan engine designs, some of which actually are used for supersonic applications in, for example, large military jets. So finding an engine with the right thrust and bypass ratio that would suit Boom's overture would therefore be difficult, but not impossible. And there might actually even be one design out there that is really close to being perfect, and that design is the General Electric Affinity. This is a conceptual engine design that General Electric was developing for the Arion supersonic AS2 business jet. Now, sadly, Arion closed its door last year because of a lack of funding, but the G General Electric affinity plants still exist and are very close to what Boom is looking for. It has a thrust of 16,000 to 20,000 pounds, that's 71 to 89 kilonewtons, and it's suitable for supersonic application because that's what it actually was made for. The General Electric Affinity uses the same core design as the CFM-56, and that's not so surprising because the core of the CFM-56 originally came from a military engine, the General Electric F-101. Various versions of the F-101 are still powering a lot of big and small military jets today, ranging from the F-16 to the B-1 and even the B-2 bomber. You can think of that next time you see a Boeing 737NG taxiing out on the apron. Anyway, the Arion AS2 private jet would have been significantly smaller than the Boom Overture and would have used three engines instead of four. Crucially, the AS2 was also designed to be a bit slower between Mach 1.4 and Mach 1.6, which would allow the engine to work without the use of variable geometry engine air inlets. That's something that both Concorde and the Tupolev 144 had, and those inlets were needed in order to slow the air down before it entered into the engine, and is typically needed for flights at higher Mach numbers. The pictures of Boom Overture doesn't show any such variable air inlets, but since the program doesn't have a specific engine yet, the lack of those details doesn't necessarily mean that they won't be added later on. The problem here is that the GE Affinity engine is only a conceptual design. This was an engine that GE could make by adjusting, updating and combining technologies from its military and commercial jet engine designs. So is there a possibility that GE might fund development of such an engine for Boom and its overture? Unfortunately, it turns out that the likely answer is no. In an interview with Leeham News, General Electric stated that it is not interested in working on an engine for the Boom overture. Pratt & Whitney aren't interested either, and the same seems to be true for Safran in France. Now, we contacted Boom Aerospace to ask them about this issue with engine suppliers and other challenges facing the program, but they politely declined an interview, and I would have really liked to hear what they had to say. But if Boom can't expect to get an engine from Rolls-Royce, General Electric, Pratt & Whitney or Safran, then which manufacturers are left? Well, there are other companies like Honeywell, Williams and a few others who make jet engines, but none come to mind that currently offer an engine of the kind of size that would be appropriate for this project. Now, it is worth pointing out here that in case it isn't already obvious, for any airliner, the engines it will use are a make or break factor in its success. If you don't have an engine, you don't have an aircraft. 
If you look at Concorde, for example, the engines were vitally important in making it possible. The Concorde used the mighty Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus 593 engines, and Snecma is today known as Safran. The precursors of the Olympus 593 variant powered the Avro Vulcan and the cancelled BIC TSR-2 bombers, and evolving this military turbojet engine into a point where it was powerful and reliable enough for the Concorde was a huge deal for the engine designers. Rolls-Royce, Snecma and the other designers of the Concorde had to, among other things, engineer a clever engine inlet system, like I talked about before, which could use early computers to keep the engines operating safely. That was known as an inlet-by-wire system that was used together with the early fly-by-wire that the Concorde also was equipped with. It was a true marvel of early aviation engineering. But all of these new systems required substantial innovation and investment, similar to what an engine manufacturer for a new supersonic engine also will have to make. Still, there are a lot of things that will likely be easier this time around. For example, Boom's Overture uses technologies in its airframe that Concorde's engineers didn't have. Composite materials makes it easier to have a pressurized cabin with a variable cross-section that can follow what we refer to as the area rule, making the aircraft more efficient in supersonic flight. Concorde's engineers also knew about this principle, but they just couldn't build such a fuselage out of aluminium and keep it light enough to be practical. Boom is taking advantage of a lot of new technologies like this, but it really needs a good engine partner to take advantage of similar or even more crucial technologies around engine development. It is actually quite troubling to see that the company has finalized its aircraft design seemingly without having an engine supplier in place. Now, there might also be the question, believe it or not, if Mach 1.7 is actually fast enough for the Boom Overture to work well for its airline customers, and I'll explain why. Obviously, Mach 1.7 is an amazing cruising speed, more than twice as fast as the Boeing 737 that I fly, and it clearly would be a big selling point for the passengers. But for this speed to provide a substantial benefit for the airlines, it would need to make it possible for them to use these jets in multiple transoceanic routes per day. That was the reason why Boeing initially aimed for its ill-fated 2707 SST to fly at Mach 3. Later versions of that design lowered those targets down to Mach 2.7. And early in the development of Boom's supersonic aircraft, there were studies about what the ideal cruise speed for this aircraft would be. And factoring in the distances between popular city pairs that are separated by oceans, plus factoring in the desirable times of day for arrival and departure at key airports, Analysts determined that Boom's supersonic jet would need a cruise speed of Mach 2.2 to be viable for its desired number of routes. Boom eventually lowered its target speed to Mach 1.7, and this probably had to do with uh, limitations on composite materials at high temperatures, or perhaps to avoid design details like those variable geometry engine inlets, which could add quite a bit of complexity and weight. Boom also didn't pursue an aerodynamic design that would minimize aerodynamic noise over land. NASA and Lockheed Martin are working on a test aircraft for exactly this purpose called the X-59 Quest. Again, avoiding such characteristics likely makes Boom design simpler, but it also limits its routes to city pairs that are across oceans. And that's because if supersonic speeds cannot be maintained over land, which is not allowed at the moment, but could be allowed if the noise is shown to be low enough, the speed over the ocean would need to be fast enough to enable these route pairings, as I mentioned before, and then Mach 1.7 might not be high enough. It is, however, good to see that Boom are trying to keep the complexities down on their design in order to make the reintroduction of a supersonic airliner more realistic. But we will have to wait for the company to announce who its engine supplier or engine partner will be to see if it can actually stick to its ambitious development timeline. Boom hopes to have a prototype for its Overture ready by 2026, with a goal to enter service before the end of the decade. And although things might look a bit bleak at the moment, I am actually really rooting for Boom to succeed. I think that we need companies like this who shoot for the stars and push us our imagination. And nothing would make me happier than seeing something with a similarly sleek design as the fantastic Concorde return back to the skies. Now, if you want to see a really fascinating story, then check out this video up here and consider joining my Patreon crew or buy yourself some merch if you want to support me and my team. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time.
Bye-bye.